Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created. He established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding, you mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and women, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. He raised up for his people a horn and praise for all his faithful servants of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Connor. Good morning, everybody. Good? Um, well, welcome and, and happy Sunday. You know, I had a, a moment last Sunday that I kind of wanted to share with you guys. And this was a moment that uh, I shared with our Teach Us to Pray class on, on Monday. And so you might've heard a little bit of this before if you're, if you're at that class. But last Sunday, you know, I, I was standing uh, over here and we started to sing the song, A Thousand Names. You guys know that song? Did you guys remember singing that last week? Were you here? I'm just kidding. So if you know that song, uh, this is a, a very powerful song where we as the body of Christ stand together and we sing the holy and glorious names of God to him. And so we call him faithful healer, faithful father, bondage breaker, rock of ages, the great I am, king forever, alpha and omega, son of man, lion of Judah, the risen lamb, the second Adam, the ocean parter, and the death defeater. And so in terms of words that one might speak in this life, this is about as meaningful and impactful and important of words as you could possibly sing. And so we're, we're here and we start to sing and I'm standing over there and I'm, you know, we're being led by this amazing worship team and we're singing these names to God. And I'm like, man, there's nothing happening in this room. There's nothing happening, nothing's moving in this room. And I turn, which I don't usually do because it's kind of awkward when you're up at the front and then you like turn around because people know that you're looking at them. And I turn and, and quite honestly, most of the room was not engaged in singing the song. And so when I say engaged, I am not talking about being slain in the spirit and running up and down the aisles and falling on the ground. I am quite literally talking about singing with your voice aloud. And it felt like most people in the room, or at least many people were just not engaging in that. And as I thought about the words that we were being invited to sing and the truth that we were being invited to declare and the act of worship that we were being invited into, I was a little bit alarmed. And you know, uh, th th there are things that I desire for this community, you know, to, to stand up here, uh, you know, the things that I say come, come from the heart. You know, this is, this is quite, quite frankly, you know, if I have anything to say, it has to come from, from the heart. And my heart for this community, like I want this to be a community of people who love God, like for real, like love him and desire him and long to be with him. And, and that we are urgent and excited to orient or reorient our lives to, to, to circle around him in his presence. And so, you know, when you, when you have your baptism and you make that confession and you join a local church, you are saying that with your words and your actions. And so it's very, very important that that's actually the case in this community, that that's actually what we love and what we want and what we do. And so if you are a part of this community, if you're part of 514 Church, if you consider this place your home and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, we should be seeking and running towards any opportunity that we have to make God happy. And we should be urgent and, and, and excited to do anything that's put in front of us that furthers the mission of bringing heaven to earth. And so my assumption 
is that there's kind of a gap of understanding, right? And that, that may be a bad assumption, but sometimes you have to make assumptions and then uh, write a message based on those assumptions. And so that's part of my, my assumption is that there's something that we don't understand about what it is that's happening when we stand and sing. There's something that we don't quite, we're not quite putting the pieces together uh, about what the story is behind that, how that fits into the mission of the church. And so as a teaching pastor of the church, uh, I can't make you sing, but I do feel a burden to at least show you and help you to understand the story and the truth behind why we sing and why we make music for God and why to stand in a congregation like this and to sing to God is an opportunity that God has graciously put in front of you to move closer to him. And so today... And next week, I think Bryce mentioned this, we're, we're beginning this series called Hallelujah. And so, does anybody know what that word means? Hallelujah in Hebrew? Praise God. So, halal means praise, and Yah is a shortened form of Yahweh, and it's a command, right? It's an imperative. It's, it's not an ought. It's a, you must praise God. And so, this week, Next week, we're going to be talking about praising God in song and in prayer. And so you, you heard that verse that Bryce opened uh, his, his host part with. I call to you, Lord. Come quickly to me. Hear me when I call to you. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. And so may our prayers be like incense. The reason that you burn incense is because the smoke of the incense rises up into the heavens and that pleasing aroma is shared with God because incense smells good and we love God. And so we wanna share that with him. And so we burn the incense and it goes up to heaven. We, we get to share that with, with, with God. May our prayers be like that, that, that when we pray together, those words go up like smoke and please God like the pleasing aroma of incense. May the lifting of our hands, the raising of our voices be like an evening sacrifice. Old Testament sacrifice was an act where you took an animal, either whole or you cut it in half and you burn it. And that burning smoke goes up to God in heaven. Have you ever been to city barbecue? How's it smell? Just go over to the Target parking lot after church. You don't even have to go in. You can just smell it. What, what does brisket on a smoker smell like? You might say it smells like heaven as an analogy. And so what we do is we burn the animal and we share that with God. We share a meal with him. We love him. We want that smell that, that, that we walk into when we go into city barbecue that makes us go, whoa, that is amazing. We wanna share that with God. And so, so that's what that sacrifice in the Old Testament is about, it's because we love him. It's offered to him because we love him and we wanna share it with him. And so our praise, the lifting of our hands ascends to heaven like that sacrifice. And so even before we get into the teaching right off the bat, we can start to see that we're not just coming here and singing songs because that's the routine. To sing songs to God is to make an offering to him. It's to offer him what we have. It's important for us as Christians to do this in every single aspect of our life that we possibly can. And so we have that opportunity here uh, when we come together. Now, I will be honest with you, uh, expressing and praising God in song is probably the least natural part of what I will call my devotional life. So I was not raised with music. I don't know anything about music. I don't play any musical instruments. I know no musical theory and my singing voice is subpar. Like four out of 10 though, it's not that bad. A uh, couple, I guess this was around Christmas, I was standing over there with my wife and uh, I can't remember what song it was, but it was kind of one of those moments where it's quiet so people can kind of hear you sing. And my wife, Jenna, can sing a little bit. And so she was singing and these, these sweet high school girls afterwards turned around and they said, you have a very beautiful singing voice and, to my wife. And I was standing there and I was like, that's sweet, and? And they did not uh, offer the same, the, the, the same to me. And so really what I would do for most of my life is I would come to church and I would stand for three songs and not really engage. And I would wait for the message because the message, that's like where the meat is, right? Like that's where like the intellection is. That's kind of what I 
connect with, which is actually not the, the proper way that we should approach listening to a sermon either, but we don't have time for that today. Um, uh, and I just wouldn't really engage in, in the singing. I thought that, that that part of church is just not really my thing. And so what we're going to talk about today and what I'm going to get to eventually is that that assumption is incorrect. It is your thing and it must be your thing. And we have to step into that. Recently, my understanding of uh, what we're doing when we come together and sing these songs to God has changed. And it's completely flipped upside down my understanding of what's happening on Sunday mornings and what it is that we get invited into. And so I wanna share that with you guys. I wanna give you what I will call a brief, you know, according to me, a brief biblical theology of worship and music. And from that, summarize why we come here and sing songs and then honestly challenge this community to come here on Sundays prepared to step boldly into the gracious invitation to sing praises to God and to offer him a sacrifice with our voices. And so here's the argument that I'm gonna go through. I'm gonna tell you and then I'm gonna do it and then I'll, I'll say it again at the end. That's some kind of strategy. So here it is. Number one, you were made to sing. You were made to. And maybe like me, you, you sing and it seems like maybe you weren't made to but you were made to. You were created as a singing being by a singing God. And so who you are supposed to be in this world, in the depths of what it means to be an image, is deeply tied to song and music to God. And so you were made to sing. Number two, God is moved by our singing. Like God is stirred by the lifting of our voices. You know, anytime we start to talk about doing for God in this church, somebody grabs us, sends us an email, wants to talk about how we just wanna make sure that we're saved by grace uh, and, and not saved by works. And so he, here's, here's what I have begun to say to people. Uh, of course, we're saved by grace. And so my life, which is a life of action, is not about doing things for God because I think that's gonna make him love me more or because I think that's gonna make me more accepted. My life, which is a life of action for God, I want that life to stir his heart. You know, when, you, when there's this parable Jesus tells of when, uh, when, when we actually come and we see God, when we see him face to face, and one of the things that he might say to you is, well, good, uh, well done, good and faithful servant. And so I want my life to stir the heart of God. And when we sing, we move him. Number three, we will sing in the new heavens and the new earth. And so our ultimate future state is one of at least partially singing to God. We're invited to start to participate in that now, today, in the present. It's very important that we do so. And number four, and I'm gonna make you uh, wait until the end because this one's interesting to me. Number four, when we sing, hell is shaken. When we sing here on Sundays, the devil is wounded and the gates of hell are pushed back. And so we'll talk about that as well. So uh, the reason that we do biblical theology at this church is because we believe that God is ultimate reality. And so we believe that everything we know about the world and everything that we might know about God, uh, we know because he reveals it to us. And so God is not a being that one can figure out. He can only be revealed. And God has graciously revealed himself both in creation and specifically in the scripture because he wants us to know him, because he wants to have an intimate relationship with us. And so I believe that God reveals the meaning and the purpose of everything in the scriptures. And so of course, if there's a deep meaning and purpose behind music and singing, then God is gonna reveal that in the scriptures as well. And so before we get into the Bible, I just want you to think about your life and think about the world that we're a part of. Life is full of music and the world is full of music. In fact, we as humans are moved by music. There's something about music that speaks deeply to us. And if you think about it, music is glorious in the literal sense of that word. Music literally glorifies things. It glorifies space, right? If you're hosting a party at your house and you're a good host, You've got, you know, finger food and people are having conversations and what's playing in the background? Music, why? Because music glorifies space. That exact same situation with no music feels totally different. 
It feels much less glorious. Um, you go into a hotel lobby. This is the hospitality industry. And so they exist literally to make you like being in their space. As you walk into the lobby, what are the two things you notice? Number one, it smells amazing. Number two, there's music playing. Why? Because they want you to enjoy that space. And music has the ability to glorify space. Music glorifies our words. There are things that you can say that become much more deeply meaningful when they're sung. You ever notice that? Like you're, you're moved by, the, gripped by a song and you look up the lyrics and you're like, well, that's not that deep. There's something about the music that makes it so. Music can glorify our mood. You know, uh, you're, you're driving in your car, just having a bad day, but then that song comes on, changes you. I know what you're thinking. I'm thinking the same thing. Love Story by Taylor Swift. What? During the climactic moment of a movie, what is going on in concert with the action on the screen? That's when the score gets big, right? That's when the music swells. That's when there's a crescendo. Why? Because the filmmaker wants you to feel something in that moment. And music glorifies our feelings. Music makes us feel deeply. Neuroscience shows that music actually can and does rewire your brain and change your neural pathways. And so music glorifies the world and it grips our soul. And I believe that the reason that this is true is because music is written into creation by a musical creator. Did you know that God sings in the Bible? God's voice thunders and the world comes forth. You know, it says that, that the word of God speaks this world into existence. And so the, the, the world is based on word, but maybe it's not just a monotone speaking voice of God that creates this world. Maybe God's word creates this world in song. In fact, this is C.S. Lewis's hypothesis, which he puts in his allegory, uh, the Magician's Nephew. You guys read the Chronicles of Narnia? It's great, great books. You should read that and make your children read that. Uh, this is what it says in the Chronicles of Narnia creation story. In the darkness, something was happening at last. A voice had begun to sing. There were no words. There was hardly even a tune, but it was beyond comparison, the most beautiful noise he had ever heard. It was so beautiful he could hardly bear it. And then two wonders happened at the same moment. One was that that voice was suddenly joined by other voices, more voices than you could possibly count. The second was that the blackness overhead all at once was blazing with stars. And if you had seen or heard it, you would have felt quite sure it was the first voice, the deep one, which made them appear and made them sing. The voice rose and rose till the air was shaking with it. And just as it swelled to the mightiest and most glorious sound that had yet produced, the sun arose. And all this made you feel excited until you saw the singer himself and then you forgot everything else. It was a lion, Aslan, huge, shaggy and bright. It stood facing the risen sun and its mouth was open in song. And so C.S. Lewis's allegory is that the world began in music. And I think that that might be true. Psalm 29.5, the voice of the Lord shatters the cedars. Have you ever heard of a soprano who can hit such a pitch that she can shatter a champagne flute, right? This is possible with, with the way that sonic waves work. And so God can shatter the mighty cedars with his mighty song. God sings over restored Jerusalem in Zephaniah 3. He sings laments like the song of the vineyard in Jeremiah chapter five, in Isaiah chapter five. His, uh, Jeremiah 48 says, his voice wails like a flute for Moab. His, he sings and his voice is music. When he speaks at Mount Sinai, you know what they say it sounds like? A trumpet. And so God is musical. The Father brings forth creation in song and he continues to sing because the Father is a musical singer. And if the Father is musical, then that means that the Son, Jesus, is musical as well. And we see this in the scriptures also. You guys ever read Song of Songs? Song of Songs is a love song between a bride and a bridegroom 
well, we are the bride, the church, and the bridegroom is Jesus Christ. And so the Song of Songs is a song that was written to us from Jesus, and we're supposed to respond back to him in a love song. When Jesus is born in Luke chapter two, the angels sing glory to God in the highest. Talked about that at Christmas, right? In Matthew 26, the last supper, before he goes to suffer for his people, it says that he leads his disciples in the singing of a hymn, probably a hallel, a praise psalm. The Psalms, speaking of which, are the hymnal of the Bible, the songbook of the Bible, and they're usually attributed to David, which is correct, but Jesus is the true David. Jesus is the perfected David. And so those Psalms, that songbook belongs to Jesus. Jesus has now ascended to the right hand of God. And Hebrews tells us that that means he is the high priest. Well, the priesthood are the singers of Israel. The high priest is the lead singers of Israel. And so if Jesus is our high priest, that means that Jesus sits in heaven as the lead singer of the redeemed church. And so the father is musical. Jesus, the son is musical. And would you be surprised if I told you that the Holy Spirit is musical as well? The, the Spirit brings forth song. The Spirit is poured out on Saul in 1 Samuel 18. He sings out a prophecy. In 2 Kings 3, the prophet Elisha is asked to prophesy about a military engagement. And he says, I don't want to because I don't like you. He's talking to a king. And then another king comes and he's like, all right, this guy's fine. I will prophesy. Bring me a harpist. And so a harpist comes and starts to play. And as soon as the harpist starts to play, the tune, it says that the hand of God came upon him, the spirit of God moved upon, upon him and he sang out a prophecy. The spirit brings forth song. Paul instructs the Ephesians to be filled with the spirit, right? Don't be filled with wine, but be filled with the spirit, right? We know that part because we try to figure out what that means about drinking alcohol. Do you know how the rest of the verse goes? Be filled with the spirit and do what? Sing hymns and songs and psalms from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. What Paul says is that when you're filled with the Spirit, one of the things that will happen as a result of this filling is that you will then sing songs to God because the Spirit brings forth song. And so the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are all musical. The God that we worship, who is Trinity, is a musical God. In fact, Jonathan Edwards said that the triune God is the supreme harmony of them all. The triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, three in one, is the supreme harmony of them all. What does he mean by this? To illustrate, I'm going to have Jackie come up here. You guys know Jackie Mitchell? She's going to she's gonna play a C chord. You probably know her as a world-famous podcaster on the greatest podcast that has yet to be released in the medium called Story, Symbol, Spirit. Check it out. She also plays keys every Sunday. And what I'm going to ask Jackie is I'm going to ask you to play a C chord. Okay, now that was it, nice. Now a C chord is a C and E and a G, is that correct? Yeah, so play it one more time. Okay, so uh, if you've been around church and people have tried to explain the Trinity to you, they give you weird analogies and they'll say things like, God is like an egg because it's like a shell and an egg white and an egg yolk. And the reason I don't like that as an analogy for the Trinity is because God is not like an egg. And so when you think of God or your children think of God, I don't want them to think of an egg. And there's other analogies like God is like water because he exists in three separate, you know, it's like three separate states. There's like gas, liquid, solid, but it's one elemental structure right? But th there's issues with that. And so all these analogies fall short. And so maybe uh, one of the best analogies is that God is like a three-note chord. Play a C again. So that is one single sound. Do you guys hear that? It's one sound. It's not three separate sounds combined. What you are hearing in that sonic space is one sound, and yet it is three notes. Three notes in one sonic space. And so the three notes do not fill up that space that you're hearing with like one third E, one third G, one third C. All three notes fully occupy the entire sonic space simultaneously, right? Like, like God. Now I'm not, I'm not an expert, but I heard someone uh, who claimed to be an expert and this was, this is from the internet. So, uh, you know, 
And he says that not only is that true, every, all three of those notes that make one sound, uh, if you can actually break down the sonic uh, you know, production of it, uh, each note voices itself through the other two notes. So the C is actually voiced through the E and the G, and the E is voiced through the C and the G, and the G is voiced through the C and the E, which is also true of God. The Father is known, but only through the Spirit and the Son. The Father speaks the life of his Son through the breath of his Spirit, like a three-note chord. And so I don't know if that's the perfect analogy, and I also didn't make it up. Uh, I'll have to spend some, some more time with it. But the least that you can say is that music itself has Trinitarian aspects to it. There are things about what Jackie just played. Play it one more time, and then you can go. <laughs> she was leaving. One more time. There are aspects to this that relate to the Trinity, which makes sense because God is musical. Give it up for Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. And so God is musical and we are images of God. And that means that we are musical. This is why music grips us. This is why music moves us. This is why music makes things feel more glorious to us because God is musical and we are his images. Joel did a series a couple of years ago about being an image of God, about what it means to be a human. What is that vocation? How do we take it seriously? And one of the things that he talked about uh, in this series was that uh, to be a human means to be a prophet and a priest and a king. So what is your life supposed to look like? You know, when we ask that question, we're always thinking about which job should I take and, you know, wh where should I move? And those are important details. But the, the main question, what is your life supposed to look like? Well, you are supposed to look like a prophet and a priest and a king. A king is one who has dominion in the name of God. And so that's a call on your life. So you're supposed to put your hands on the world and have dominion over it and with those image of God powers, take that world that you, that you touch and take it from glory to further glory. You're supposed to be a king. You're supposed to be a priest. A priest is someone who mediates God to the world, right? We say that we are the light of the world. What do you think that means? It means that the light of God is supposed to come into us and shine out of us. It, the, the glory of God comes into us, and then that is mediated and given to the world like a priest does. And so that's a call on your life. You're supposed to be a king. You're supposed to, to be a priest. And you're also supposed to be a prophet because uh, prophets are people who go into the divine council and consult with God and then make decisions with him in this world. And so what do you think is happening when you pray? Where are you going? You're going into the council and you're speaking to the Father in the Son through the Spirit. And what is supposed to come from that is that you're supposed to take that and then make decisions with God in this world. And so you're supposed to be a prophet, you're supposed to be a priest, and you're supposed to be a king. In the Old Testament, there were prophets and there were priests and there were kings, but now in the church, we're all supposed to be all three of those things. And so when you read the Bible and you see what's going on with priests and prophets and kings, one of the things that you'll see is that all three of these roles sing in the Old Testament. All three of these roles are singing musical roles. Priests sing. In fact, it's one of their key functions in the temple. They sing and play musical instruments in the temple. Prophets sing. Much of the prophetic recordings is poetry, right? Probably written with music. I think that this is why Elisha asked for a harpist because he was about to, he needed a beat. And kings sing in the Bible. You know, who's like the prototype of a godly king in the Old Testament? It's David. Well, what else did David do? He's the sweet psalmist of Israel, right? And so kings sing. God sings in the Bible. You are an image of God. To be an image of God means to be a prophet, priest, and king. Prophets sing, priests sing, kings sing. And so you might be like me and have a moment in your walk with God where you think the musical part, the singing part of church that's just not really my thing. Now, the problem is, is that you have to ask the follow-up question, are you a human? Then it's your thing. You were made for this. Who you are is deeply tied to song. We have to sing to God. And it's important with our relationship to God. One of the implications of God being musical is that it means that God then responds to music. And so you read the Bible and you see this, that God is stirred 
by the singing of his people. Psalm 22 said that he inhabits the praises of his people. His dwelling is in the praises of his people. He's enthroned on the praises of his people. And you see this in 2 Chronicles 5, the temple is built and, it, and the ark is brought in and it's dedicated with sacrifices and prayer and song. And so what does God do? He shows up, manifest presence. The fire of God comes into the temple at least partly as a response to song. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are thrown in jail in Philippi. And at midnight, it says that they were praying and singing hymns to God. And then guess what happens? He shows up and there's a violent earthquake and they're freed from prison. When we sing to God, who is in his essence musical, he responds because it connects us to him, right? We have all of these phrases in terms of communication in English, where we say, you know, are we speaking the same language? Are we on the same page? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? We have to get on the same wavelength, right? All of these colloquialisms just mean like, are we like connected to each other in this communication right now? Well, music does that for us and God. It puts us on his wavelength. If he's musical, then when we sing, we get connected to him. And there's an intimacy that happens in that. And quite frankly, this should be all that's needed right? For us to have a new perspective. Now, of course, I'm going to overdo it and keep going, but that really should suffice, right? Should we sing to God? Well, do you yearn to be close to him? Like, do you want him? I mean, you understand that's the question of the Christian life, right? Like we have all these questions about God and a lot of times it boils down to, does he want us? But the whole history of the world is the history of how badly God wants us. That is not the question. The question is, do we want him? If we want him, then any gift that he puts in front of us and anything that he gives us that would allow us to move nearer to him, we should urgently and with joy pick up. And if singing does that, which I think that, that it does, then that should really be all that we need to change this. You know, the same is true of, of prayer, right? We talked about this on Monday at our prayer class, but the most important thing in prayer is beholding and being with God. It doesn't mean that we can't ask him for things. We're actually told to ask for things. But the most important part of prayer is to look at him. That's why the Lord's Prayer begins with a description of God, not by a request from him. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name, before anything is asked for. Because the point of prayer, at least the most fundamental point of prayer, is to be connected to God. And when we enter into the intentionality of prayer, we do get connected with him. And the same thing is true of singing, right? When we sing to God in worship, we are essentially praying to him musically, right? It's just like prayer, but louder and our voices go up and down. Shout out to Elf. James says that the spirit jealously yearns, but that God draws near to those who draw near to him. So that's a promise. You guys know that? That's not a probability. That's, that's a promise. God draws near to those who draw near to him. If singing can draw us near to God, then the promise is that God will respond by drawing near to us. And so if you feel distant from God, the question will be, do you sing to him? If you, if you feel stuck in a relationship with him and you're wondering why you've kind of hit this plateau, you know, do you sing to him? It's not the solve for, for that entire uh, season that we walk through sometimes, but, but it's very, very important, and many of us don't. Um, God loves our music. Isn't that interesting? It pleases him. Uh, in fact, God is in heaven, and in heaven, he is eternally in the midst of music. And so the scriptures say that heaven is filled with angelic armies. It's also filled with angelic singers. Heaven is a place of music. That Psalm that Connor read, Psalm 148, begins with praise him, all his angels, praise him, heavenly hosts, praise him, all you shining stars, praise him, you highest heavens. The heavens declare the glory of God, both with beauty and in song. In Job 38, when God lays the foundations of the world, it says that the sons of God, the angels were singing and shouting for joy. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah is called into the throne room of God. He finds himself in the throne room. He sees the seraphim, the burning ones, flying around the throne of God, and they're singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth is full of his glory. 
And they're singing this over and over and over again. John in Revelation is invited into the throne room and he sees the same thing. And so here we are on earth and earth is not yet joined to heaven, but that is our destiny. Ephesians 1.10, to unite all things in heaven and on earth in Jesus Christ. And so do you ever wonder why? Uh, You know, since that's our destiny, God gives us pictures, you know? It's not the real thing fully yet, but we see glimpses because he wants us to look at him. You ever wonder why birds fly around in the sky and sing pretty songs? It's kind of a mystery to scientists. They understand some of the communicative aspects of the songs of birds, but they don't know why it's beautiful. But Christians know why it's beautiful because in heaven, there's winged creatures who are flying around singing worship to God. God wants us to know what he's like. And so here we are on earth and we have winged creatures that fly around in the sky and and sing. Heaven and earth have been torn apart because of sin, but that is not the way that things are supposed to be. And the purpose of the image of God, of us human beings, the prophets, priests, and kings of this world is to put the earth back together with heaven. That's our job, that's our role, that's our purpose in the power and in the name of God. So in the Lord's prayer, we say, your kingdom come, your will be done, where? Here on earth as it is where? Right, because that's what we're doing, right? We're putting it back together. One day it will be fully back together. In the meantime, we live and when we live as Christians and when we obey what it is we're supposed to do, little pockets of heaven pop up around us, real heaven right? It's, it's a down payment. It's the first fruits, but it's real. When you take wheat from the first fruit harvest and you bring it in, that's not the full harvest, but it's not fake wheat. It's real wheat. And so the, the foretaste of heaven that pops up around us when we fulfill our vocation, that is real heaven. It's not the full thing. It's not all of it, but it, but it is actually real. And so what is heaven like? If we're supposed to make earth like heaven. What's it like? Some of that is actually very mysterious because not as much has been revealed uh, about heaven as some of our pop culture thinks, at least, uh, at least biblically, but we do know some things about heaven. What is one of the things that's going on in heaven? Music. They're singing to God. So if we're supposed to make heaven and earth come together, if we're supposed to do his will here as it is there, if we're supposed to make earth like heaven now, what is one of the things that we have to do? We've got to sing to God. It's not all that we should do, but it is a non-negotiable part of it. We have to. One day, the hosts of earth, human beings, and every creature with breath will sing a harmony with the angels, and heaven and earth will be joined, and we will praise God. That is our destiny. And so when we come together and praise God here in the gathering, one of the things that we are doing is we are bringing that future, the very destiny of earthly creation into the here and now. When we sing to God, we participate today in what is promised to come fully later. We call forth at least a part of that final state of being right now. And so we sing because we were made to sing made to sing by God who sings. We sing because it's a key part of what it means to be a human. We sing because it makes God happy. It moves him and it connects us with him. And we sing because to sing now is to participate at least to some degree in our future destiny. And I have one final point about why we sing to God. And I hope that this connects with some people because uh, this was very, very pivotal for me in, in terms of worship. When we sing, we declare the truths of God. We declare who he is. We declare what he's done. Who are we declaring that truth to? Well, we declare it to each other, right? And that edifies and builds and strengthens the body. We declare that to God and that moves God and makes him happy. You know who else we declare it to? The enemy. We declare these truths to the devil and his host, to the powers in the principalities that we are currently at war with. Right now, singing is a weapon. When we sing that Jesus has destroyed death and conquered the grave, the devil and his host are tortured. When we sing that God is holy and worthy of praise, the devil and his host are afflicted. 
And when we sing that the blood of Jesus has washed us clean and made us children of God and that there's nothing that the accuser of the brethren has left to condemn us with, even the thing he once had, death, has been snatched away from him by Jesus Christ, the conqueror. When we sing that, the gates of hell are pushed back and the devil and his host are struck. You know, uh, if you wanna live in the part of the purpose of your being, you gotta sing. If you wanna prophetically declare the future, you gotta sing. If you wanna please God and draw near to him, you have to sing. But if you wanna enter the fray, if you wanna go and step up to the front lines, if you wanna fight the forces of evil and darkness and the principalities that wanna steal from you and lead you and your loved ones to death, if you wanna fight that war, if you wanna fight that battle, this is it. This is it. This is a weapon. This is part of it. And it begins now. You want to take a militant stand for God in this world and declare him in song. Uh, the call to sing and worship God goes out to the entire church. But I just want to take a moment and I want to speak to the men in the room. Okay. And that is because uh, I was asking our staff, you know, what is going on? Like, what is the resistance on Sunday mornings to, to singing sometimes? And we had a really good discussion and lots of good points were made. At some point, someone raised their hand and said, the women sing. This is important. In my experience, when men burn for God, they want to enter the fray. They want to do for him. They want to fight for God. This is the way that zeal tends to manifest in the male heart. And so the question then, men, is what can we do? What can we do for God? How can we fight? Well, we can sing these songs. You know, we can cry out to God. We can shout down the devil with the truth of God. We can wash the city in praise. We can sing these truths over our family like a protective shield. You can take up your arms and pick up your weapons and fight the dark powers. If we as men refuse to sing, we are refusing to fight. We are laying down the weapon that David cast the demons out of Saul with. We're laying down the weapon and choosing not to pick up the weapon that Paul used to spring himself from prison. And so we can't be a church that lays down our arms. We can't be a church that refuses to step into the battle. There is a battle happening for your soul and for your wife's soul and for your children's souls. And so I don't think I need to remind you that upon your confession of faith and upon your baptism, you were enlisted in that holy war and you were enlisted to wage war on the enemy. And so in this life, you as a Christian must fight to demolish the strongholds of the devil. And you must use the weapons that are available to do so. 2 Corinthians 10, 4, our weapons are not of this world. On the contrary, they have the divine power to demolish strongholds. And so what Paul is saying, our weapons are not of this world. They actually have power. So what he's saying is that your fists can't demolish the strongholds of the devil and your guns can't demolish the strongholds of the devil and neither can your politics and neither can your intellect, but prayer can and singing the truths of God's victory over those powers can. And so we sing. And when our men sing again, we will feel it. And so will Satan. And so I told you, that singing praise is not the easiest thing for me. And so this understanding has changed me. I want to be near to God. I want to live into the purpose of what I was created to be. And I want to spend this life on the front lines, fighting for my family, fighting for the church, fighting for the loved ones. And there's all kinds of ways that we do this. But, but one of them is that we come here and we sing. And so I've had to orient my life differently. Uh, and so one of the routines that I have now, and this is only a few months old, so I'm not an expert in this. I get in my car, I got about a 20 minute commute and I, I just wail worship songs. And my two favorite songs are Revelation Song and Forever, which are both by Carrie Job, which basically makes them unsingable because of her voice. 
And so I cannot sing them, but I can scream them. And I do, because I believe that those words in that song goes out over my family and over my city and over my church and whatever interaction I might have that day with the powers of evil, I've already declared my position, I've already declared my intention, and I've already declared my allegiance, and I've already stated the truth of Jesus Christ and his victory over the grave. And so that's when I'm by myself. I believe it has that kind of impact. Now, what about when we stand together and sing? What about when we come in here as a church and not only are you singing like that, but you look over there and so is she. Well, that is a child of God with the power of the Holy Spirit residing in here, the same power that rolled the stone away and raised Christ from the dead. And so now she's singing and so is he, and he's a child of God and he has the power of that spirit. And so is she, and so is he, and so is he. So what's happening when we're singing, one of the things is that this is, this is, a, this is a, an, an army, right? This is the militia who's fighting against the powers of darkness by declaring the truth of God. And when we sing like that together, the devil trembles. And so we have to sing. And I'm not saying you have to sing well, but you have to sing. And if the people around you uh, are uncomfortable with the, the, the quality of your voice, you can remind them that you are fighting the principalities and the powers of the devil on their behalf as a brother or sister in Christ. And so we have to sing, we're gonna have the band come up here and uh, I'm gonna pray and it's gonna lead us into a song. And maybe uh, you didn't know this, maybe this is new information, maybe you did know it, but, but this is reinvigorating what you think this is. But when, uh, when we stand and when we sing, I want you to take a step. And so if you don't usually sing out loud, I want you to sing out loud. If you don't usually put your hand in the air, put your hand in the air or put your hands out or do something, take that step because I believe that God is calling this church to step into the things that bring him near. And, and, and singing brings God near. And so take a step, whatever that means for you, whatever that next thing is, whatever you've been previously uncomfortable with, let's take that, let's pray together. God, you promised us that you draw near when we draw near and you are more faithful than we are. And so I just wanna ask you today that if this congregation, if this group of people takes a step towards you and sings in a way that they have it in order to draw near to you, then I wanna call upon you to make good on your promise and to show up and to be here and to give us your presence and to manifest it in a way and to allow us to see that you're near, to see that you're here and to feel that God. Father, we acknowledge that we are at war in this world and you have given us the weapon of our voice to crush the head of the serpent. Allow us to use that. Do not allow the fear of man do not allow the discomfort to stop us from fulfilling our destiny, to stop us from taking back what's ours, to stop us from doing the very thing that we were created to do. And so God, I ask for zeal when we sing. I ask for fire when we sing, fire in our hearts, fire in the words of the song. God, I ask for your power. It is in your son Jesus' name that we pray and in the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. We want to connect with you. So go ahead and text that number on your screen uh, and somebody will reach out. We want to get to know you and your story a little bit more. Uh, we hope you have a great week and we will see you next time.